Pope Francis is in Asia for his longest overseas trip yet. In Timor-Leste, he will find a country where nine in ten are Catholic. This coming of a Pope is really a dream. A dream of the, of the people like to meet. But it is also a country in dire need of development. And in Indonesia, the Pope will visit the world's most populous Muslim nation, wrestling between religious moderation and conservatism. I think what will the Pope's visit to Asia bring? Fatigue, Bolu, Aria Branca. Maybe Tempu, Indonesian Tempu, Fatigue, Bolu, Pasir Puti. Fatigue, Augusta Tevis, Aria Branca, Augusta Tevis. Dalla Ruma, here Domingo, oh, Talves, here Kalan, Dalla Ruma, Karamai, refreshing, Hamni Kakuta. For the last nine years, Josefina ran her own travel agency here in Dili, the capital of Timor-Leste. She caters to local travellers and a handful of tourists, mainly from Australia. Our personal, agora agora momento agora da daune la la dum barak me be ihe Timor ne ni natural teves i furak so ke ma la ihe turista si ramai to me visita ami rai me se dau ke me be ami anesan zoven. In a few weeks, Josefina and Timor Leste's fortunes could change. International attention will fall on the country when a popular global figure sets foot on this tiny nation of 1.3 million people. I resist Hello, visitor, uh, my uh, Timor Leste. I'm simply uh, content, you know, for good of the tapes. And it's an story of Fonida, uh, uh, Baba, I'm Durant, and I'm Haredit, Lucy, Television, maybe, yeah, in moment, you know, I'm a car to assist the uh, director, and uh, Papa, yeah, it's near uh, Ryan. Earlier this year, Pope Francis announced plans for his seventh trip to Asia. He will travel through Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, Timor-Leste, and finally, Singapore. In his 11 years as head of the Catholic Church, this 12-day Asia tour will be the pontiff's longest overseas visit yet, coming at the time when he's reportedly growing frail with age. We are all very surprised that they decided to carry such a heavy, long trip. Uh, we're not putting too much on the basket of the Pope, who is turning 88 in December. So clearly, yeah, Asia remains a priority. Francis has still a very strong will and is pushing forward. In Europe and North America, the Church is in decline. In Latin America, Catholicism has stagnated. It is in Asia, together with Africa, where the number of Catholic devotees continue to grow. Now, about 11% of the world's Catholics live in Asia. Oh, Asia, big market, not many Catholics. We need to convert more people. I don't buy this analysis. He's trying to make sure that we listen and adjust our Catholic organization into more Asian uh, patterns. Because in Asia, we have seen very resilient political system religious traditions and rich, vivid traditions, the Catholic Church needs to not only hear them, but really embrace them. The pontiff's impending visit is a much anticipated one for many Timorese. Outside of the Vatican, Timor-Leste has the world's highest proportion of Catholics. Almost 98% of the population profess the faith. 
and the Timorese government is pulling out all the stops for the papal visit. To prepare for Pope Francis's welcome, the authorities approved a budget of 12 million US dollars, a sizable sum for a country with a GDP of just around 3 billion. It is important to us, to the people. We are a new country facing many, many challenges to develop the country, to better the life of the people. That is why we used to say that hope is the last thing that will die. This year, when we celebrate the 25th years of referendum, the visit of Pope Francis will be like joining our people to celebrate this victory of our people. For us, it will be an honor. So the presence of the Pope is a very important of affirming the identity of these people, that we have our own identity as a Catholic in this corner of the world. How did the church become so intertwined with Timor-Leste's identity? Though Catholicism was brought to the island by the Portuguese colonizers back in the 1500s, the mass conversion of the population is a result of its more recent turbulent history. The year is 1989. Timor-Leste is welcoming a very special visitor. Pope John Paul II, who was Pope from 1978 to 2005, was the first pontiff to visit the island. At that time, Timor-Leste was known as Timor Timor, or East Timor, and under harsh Indonesian rule. John Paul II was visit here in a very, very difficult time, but it's most needed visit at the time. In 1989, um, where people are desperate about the loss, about the fate of their resistance, and about all the atrocities committed by Indonesia during this period of time. Indonesia's rule of Timor-Leste was a violent and turbulent one. Between one to 200,000 people were estimated to have been killed in this period. Some of that history is memorialized here at the Central National Chega Museum, where Hugo Fernandez is the executive director. This is a, a former prison. It was particularly used for detained political prisoners since 1975, during the Civil War, and also immediately after the Indonesian invasion. Either you survive or you're going to disappear and no one knows about you. On November 28, 1975, East Timor had declared independence, ending 400 years of Portuguese rule. But just nine days later, Indonesia invaded, beginning a 24-year period of Indonesian rule. As an act of resistance, many Timorese converted to Catholicism during this period. Before the invasions, I think only 10% of the population of Timor, less at the time, is a Catholic. And then uh, immediately after the invasions, 90%. So to be an Indonesian citizen, you have to identify yourself with a religion, one of the five religions acknowledged by Indonesia. And Timorese, uh, without much knowledge about religion, they all opted to become Catholic. For Timorese people, Islam was clearly not an appealing option. It was perceived as the religion of the invader, the Indonesian army. Catholicism was a global network that could help them to attract global attention on what was happening in the 80s, 1990s in Timor. And the visit of John Paul II is a perfect example of this. So, during his visit in 1989, John Paul II called for Indonesia to respect the rights of the Timorese. This, despite previously promising the Indonesian government not to broach the matter. During his mass, activists unfurled banners, calling to free East Timor, bringing the occupation to widespread international attention for the first time. 
Some regard the pontiff's visit as the catalyst for eventual independence. 73-year-old Florentino Sarmento was there that day as part of the choir. I was there, right in front of the altar, when part of the choir that uh, performed during the Holy Mass in 1989. The resistance movement was very strategic, clever, to take that opportunity with the presence of the international media. But in the decade that followed, change would also come to Indonesia. By 1998, the archipelago's second president, Suharto, had fallen from power. Suharto had ordered the Timor invasion in 1975. His successor, President B.J. Habibie, facing international pressure, allowed an independence referendum to proceed in East Timor in 1999. Over three quarters of Timorese voted for independence, and after a few years of fighting between pro-Indonesia and pro-independence groups, they achieved sovereignty by 2002. East Timor became Timor-Leste. When we were part of Indonesia, we were a minority. Minority like, you know, ethnic, minority in religion. Now, after being a nation, we are the majority. To commemorate the visit that started the road to independence, a six-meter bronze statue of Pope John Paul II now stands at the site of his visit. A short distance away, work has begun on a new altar, purpose-built for Pope Francis's impending visit. After the welcome ceremony uh, in the front, the Pope will come and stand here in order to celebrate the Mass. He will accompany it by around a hundred uh, bishops and cardinals. Right uh, in the back of that greenhouse, there is a post there, a cutting post. It was the post where we raised our flag for the first time as an independent country. When Pope Francis visits Timor-Leste from September 9th, like his predecessor, he will find a country at a crossroad. 25 years since the independence vote, Timor-Leste remains one of the poorest countries in Asia. 20 years later, the development is not there. Will hosting a second papal visit be as transformative for Timor-Leste as the first, this time in terms of the economy? Perched high atop Cape Fatukama in Timor-Leste, seven kilometers out from the center of capital Dili, stands a towering statue. It is called Cristo Rey, or Christ the King. The monument was built in 1996 by the Indonesians as a gift to the Timorese people. While some initially saw it as Indonesian propaganda, in time, the religious effigy came to be embraced as a symbol of Timorese pride and identity. Yet, though many are excited for Pope Francis's impending visit, some, like researcher and community organizer Fernando Jimenez, remain circumspect. The issue at hand, the price tag for the Pope's three-day visit. I heard that there's around 12 million, if I'm not mistaken, and it's huge, it's uh, more than enough. It, it can tackle so many problems in Timor. If we can allocate it to build a library, a community housing, or uh, education. 30-year-old Fernando is a bit of a rarity in Timor-Leste. He has a master's degree in international relations in a country where roughly half the youth do not finish secondary school but his qualifications did not guarantee Fernando a job. Sometimes people graduated in certain areas, but they are not allocating on a, on a specific field that they are supposed to be there. Because of lack of investment on, on critical industry and sectors, agriculture or education or health or, um, or tourism. 
Timor-Leste is one of Asia's poorest countries. According to the IMF, Timor-Leste's GDP per capita is around 1,400 US dollars, the second lowest in Southeast Asia, after war-torn Myanmar. While it has a youthful population, with just over 60% under the age of 30, about 9.6% of Timorese between 15 and 24 are unemployed. At the same time, around one in three youth are not in employment, education or training. In economic terms, they are sitting idle. I'm not trying to minimize the preparations of the Pope's visit, but I think we could use the money wisely to other more important areas that also needed for the country's uh, development. We do not have many investments yet in order to create a, a job for the, for the young people. Many schools have not been built, or there are schools, but there's no facilities. As for Fernando's mother, she does not share Fernando's view. What is reflected in Fernando's family is the changing relationship between the church and the Timorese. Many of the older generation converted for political reasons. The younger generation, however, must find a different connection to the faith. We see the young generation becoming a little, how to say, hesitant about the relevance of the church to implement development and uh, social justice. It's clear that the church has been a resource for political struggle and access to national independence. But I heard people complaining that the liberation of the people liberation from poverty is not quite yet. The years following independence were troubled ones, with armed riots in 2006 and attacks on the president and prime minister in 2008. Development stalled during this period. Though growth has improved, currently the economy is highly concentrated in one area, oil and gas. It accounts for almost 90% of Timor-Leste's exports and more than 80% of the state's revenue. It is one of the few industries where opportunities can be found for people like Sebastio Maria Pereira. He works at Timor Gap, the national oil company. When we finish high school, uh, the petroleum is, is the topic everyone to talk about. I think the money coming from the oil and gas. I think we have been using that money to, to run the country. So in a way, with this resource, we, we build schools, we build training facilities. And I myself have, have benefited from it. My, 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 my family and myself have benefited from it. After getting a government scholarship, Sebastio studied in Australia before returning home to work and contribute to his country. As an engineer, you need a challenge. Getting back to your country, you build your country from scratch. Young people from developed country, they don't have a chance, this opportunity, where they experience change, failures, and, and also you have to build from, uh, the system from scratch. But the oil well is running dry. Some estimates say Timor-Leste's current active oil fields could be depleted as early as 2030. Though other oil fields are being explored, none are actively exploited yet. Sometimes we say that we depend so much of oil and gas, but we, are, we thank very much for having this, for having the petroleum fund. Oil and gas, we are preparing our people to respond to these uh, challenges of our country. We will uh, try our best to start uh, motivating micro, small and medium enterprises to our youth to start 
feeling, oh, I can do this, I can do this. But uh, to implement the vision, it always takes time. One area which the government wants to grow is tourism. Pre-pandemic, almost 75,000 international tourists visited the island nation in 2018. The government wants to boost this to 200,000 visitors by 2030. Turismo ia timorne, a mini de sezu, ba ia mini a governo, para si rebel hadia fati, ke turistif si reia, si rebel hadia, atune a mi bele promo veluta na mini a be fati si rene, atune bele atrai turista si re, bele mai visita ia mini rai. And here is where the Pope's visit could benefit Timor Leste. For a few days in September, Timor Leste's international profile will be raised, and with it, a chance to show to both potential investors and visitors alike a country of rugged natural beauty. Now enjoying a period of stability after years of post independence turmoil. <laughs> Tamba Liliu Bami, Pesual Timorni, Ami Amni de Se Amnia Hanoini, Sira Mai Timor, Silori Timorni, Atubele Promove Ami Timorni, Liliu Beha Ari Turisani, Bele Diaclita. I can only say that uh, he is coming at the right time. We are trying to push the economic growth in terms of productivity. And we are open to for investments that can also offer more opportunities of jobs. It will be a good impact for the people because they will be there to listen and then I'm sure the message of the Pope will reach to everybody. The message also will be all will uh, stimulate the youngsters. The visit of the Pope I will say that uh, does not guarantee that this country will turn overnight to become the more attractive, uh, especially for the investors to come and invest here. There are a lot of things need to be done here in this country. Pope's visit is one thing, development of the country is another thing. For Sebastio, at least, he hopes others will be inspired to stay and contribute to the next phase of Timor Leste's development, crucial in a country that suffers from brain drain. So I, I call out to uh, my, my countrymen and try to work hard, find alternatives, try to contribute as much as, as you can within your abilities to the country. So, but while doing that, we may move slowly but surely, we will get in there. Before going to Timor Leste, Pope Francis will kick off his Asian tour in Indonesia, making good on a personal invitation by President Joko Widodo. Why is Indonesia so keen to host a papal visit? For more than a decade now, Every Sunday, Ferry Lesmana has the same routine. Drive from his home in Kota Baru to the St. Ignatius Church in Chimai, around 15 kilometers away. Selama 12 tahun ini memang belum ada gedung gereja selama ini. Perjalanan saya tempuh selama 30 menit. Kalau lancar, kadang kalau macet mungkin sekitar 35-40 Paroki kami memiliki jumlah umat lebih dari 11.000 jiwa. Sekarang ini Paroki Cimahi memiliki gereja paroki yang hanya menampung 400 jiwa. Jadi bisa dibayangkan dari 11.000 jiwa hanya bisa masuk tertampung dalam gereja 400. There are about 4,000 Catholics living in Ferry's neighborhood of the Padalarang sub-district. And, like him, they all have to make the long trek if they want to go for Mass. 
That's because for the last 15 years, the construction license to build a church in his area had been withheld. Peronan perizinan untuk pembangunan gereja kami di awal-awal ditolak karena ada beberapa persyaratan yang masih kurang lengkap. Salah satu syarat untuk pembangunan gereja di tempat kami adalah adanya tanda tangan dari warga sekitar yang khususnya non Katolik sejumlah 60 tanda tangan. The community has struggled to get the requisite number of signatures from the Muslims living here. Ya pada 15 tahun yang lalu kenapa kami terhambat karena ada oknum di tengah masyarakat yang dipengaruhi saya tidak tahu persis mungkin uh, orang yang ekstrim atau bagaimana tetapi pada akhirnya itu yang membuat kami sulit untuk melanjutkan proses perizinan. Indonesia has long prided itself as a moderate Muslim country. Religious tolerance is enshrined in its state ideology, known as Pancasila. Although 87% of its population is Muslim, the archipelago recognizes six official religions – Islam, Christianity, Catholicism, Hinduism, Buddhism and Confucianism. Religious minorities relationship in Indonesia is quite complex, even though we could see that there are some progress in the relationship, but of course we cannot deny that there are some incidents that might still hinder some minority to practice their religious practices freely and expressing their uh, belief freely. Yang paling jelas dan beberapa kali sempat terjadi itu ya memang adalah penolakan rumah ibadah, lalu kemudian penolakan kegiatan doa. Hakertan is a researcher at the Satara Institute, tracking incidents of religious intolerance around the country. It recorded 329 actions infringing on religious freedom in 2003, compared to 334 in 2022 and 316 in 2021. Dari riset tersebut ada temuan-temuan peraturan-peraturan yang memang diskriminatif dari pemerintah sebenarnya terhadap kelompok-kelompok minoritas yang ada pada suatu daerah gitu di mana memang ada kesulitan-kesulitan yang dialami oleh uh, masyarakat minoritas untuk uh, memperoleh hak kebebasan beragama dan berkeyakinan pada suatu daerah. Menurut saya, kita sebagai masyarakat Indonesia ini harusnya sadar bahwa kita ada di realitas yang memang plural. Bangsa Indonesia tidak hanya terbentuk dari satu etnis atau satu agama. One concern among minorities is the call for Sharia laws to be implemented by the government. A call championed by those like the Mujahideen Council, an umbrella organization of conservative Islamist groups. Saya rasa memang umat Islam ini sekarang agak tidak mendapat tempat yang semestinya sebagai sebuah komunitas yang memang mayoritas di negeri ini yang dalam uh, lintasan sejarah, tatkala mayoritas itu baik, maka akan baiklah negara itu, akan baik masyarakat itu. Sehingga kita ingin bahwa aturan-aturan Islam ini bisa diakomodir di dalam undang-undang dan peraturan pemerintah yang notabene sekarang ini kita lihat tidak berdasarkan kepada ajaran agama. Many in Indonesia agree with Sobaran's view. In a 2022 Pew survey, almost two-thirds of Indonesian Muslims want Sharia to be the law of the land. Intoleransi beragama di Indonesia ini kadang menjadi uh, seolah-olah menaik karena viral. Dari kasus-kasus yang kecil kemudian diviralkan, akhirnya seolah-olah umat Islam itu intoleran. Intoleransi ini bisa selesai tatkala para pemimpin agama khususnya, ya, para pegiat, ya, gereja, pegiat di masjid dan lain sebagainya, untuk membuka sebuah uh, komunikasi ya, berterus terang. So, it is against this backdrop that Pope Francis is visiting Indonesia. Pontiff was meant to visit the region in 2020, a trip postponed due to the pandemic. Then in 2022, Indonesian President Joko Widodo 
extended a personal invitation to the Pope. Ini barangkali Pak Joko sebagai Presiden Indonesia, ya inginlah menghormati tokoh dunia internasional, tokoh agama, tokoh leader untuk berkunjung Indonesia. Akan menyaksikan secara langsung bagaimana kehidupan beragama Indonesia yang penuh dengan toleran, penuh dengan saling menghargai, sesuai dengan agamanya masing-masing. The Pope will meet the President and other leaders, as well as whole mass at the Jalora Bung Karno Stadium, where almost 80,000 are expected to attend. Kalau persiapan, setiap bagian itu mempersiapkan secara detail. Jadi kurang lebih akan datang sekitar 80 ribu umat Katolik yang mewakili seluruh Indonesia. Katolik di Indonesia sekitar 8 sampai 9 juta. Jadi ya diwakili oleh tidak sampai 1 persen. Currently, Preparations are underway at the Jakarta Cathedral to welcome the Pope. This is the chair that will be used by Pope Francis during the prayer meeting here. He will sit and preside the prayer meetings. Pope Francis, I believe, would like to gather all the religious leaders and to uh, pray together with them to say that hopefully we walk together in the same direction and that kind of direction is for a better humanity. Pope Francis will also visit a Jakarta landmark just opposite the cathedral, the Istiqlal Mosque. It is the most important mosque in Indonesia and the largest in Southeast Asia. Istiqlal means independence in Arabic and in the spirit of Indonesia's multiculturalism, it was designed by a non-Muslim architect. Frederick Silaban, a devout Christian, was commissioned by First President Sukarno to work on the mosque. Kehadiran Paulus di Masjid Istiqlal itu bisa dikatakan bahwa ini satu tanda bahwa Istiqlal itu itu bisa diterima semua pihak. Ya bukan hanya diterima oleh umat Islam itu sendiri, tapi juga diterima oleh tokoh-tokoh agama lain. Completed in 1978, Istiqlal is deeply interwoven with Indonesia's Pancasila ideology of national unity and identity. Here, the Pope will meet leaders of other faiths and the gathered crowds. Nah, saya begi, sebagai seorang pimpinan agama, saya kira bisa merasakan kehadiran wajah-wajah yang mendemputnya di Indonesia. Bahwa inilah wajah toleransi, inilah wajah Indonesia yang penuh dengan persahabatan. Kita punya Pancasila, dasar negara yang sangat ideal untuk kita, untuk bangsa Indonesia terutama. Bangsa yang terdiri dari sekian ratus suku, sekian budaya, sekian agama. Dengan dasar Pancasila, sudah 79 tahun kita bisa bersatu. Dan mampu melawan setiap ada tantangan di tengah jalan. Francis using this trip to Indonesia as a global statement about Muslim-Christian dialogue. Which is very important. It's a visit to Indonesia, yes, but it is a global statement about Christian-Muslim dialogue first. As for Ferry, living in Kota Baru, his long drives to the church may soon be a thing of the past. After a 15-year delay, approval for a church in Kota Baru Parahyangan has finally been given. Ground was broken in January. Lokasi ini seluas 2000 meter persegi di mana kami akan mendirikan gereja keberhasilan mendapatkan izin membangun gereja ini sebenarnya menunjukkan bahwa ketika kita terbuka mau berjumpa mau berrelasi maka disitulah juga akan terjalin kerukunan. The new church is expected to be complete in 2 to 3 years time. Dengan adanya masjid dan kemudian nanti ada gereja Santo Benediktus, itu akan menunjukkan bahwa kawasan Kota Baru Parahyangan ini adalah kawasan yang toleran. Setiap orang bisa saling menyapa, saling menghormati satu sama lain. But despite all the optimism, 
Will the Pope's visit move the needle among the conservatives in Indonesia? And as for Timor Leste, will it bring the change the country desperately needs? September 3rd, Pope Francis has arrived in Indonesia. It is the seventh trip he has made to the Asian continent, and the 12-day visit will be his longest yet. Pope visit has a very symbolic meaning for a religious tolerance in Indonesia because Pope is the highest level in the Catholic and visiting Muslim majority country in Indonesia. But I think relying only on Pope visit is not enough to enhance religious tolerance in Indonesia. I think that for the Muslim majority, oh yeah, Pope Francis is coming. We kind of heard about it. Yeah, so what? Great, nothing very surprising. It's not that a big deal. Sometimes religious tolerance to me feels like the piece of a cemetery. Oh, it's very quiet and good because we are just laying next to each other and we don't engage, we don't move. But that's pure lip service. So I hope that we move from religious tolerance to religious engagement, where we take other religion truly as a gift of God and not as a threat to the privileges of my community. Kedatangan Paus di sini kami sangat senang apabila diberi kesempatan untuk berdialog dengan beliau karena beliau adalah pimpinan tertinggi umat Katolik sehingga mudah-mudahan dengan keterus terangan kemudian apa yang kami sampaikan ini bisa membuka sebuah wacana baru bagaimana Indonesia ke depan ini akan menjadi lebih baik. Toleransi kehidupan beragama khususnya di Indonesia ini saya rasa cukup cukup baik. Hanya persoalannya memang di antara agama-agama para pengikutnya khususnya para pemimpinnya, para ulamanya, para pastornya perlu melakukan sebuah transparansi. Where the conservatives may take issue is Pope Francis's position on LGBTQ issues. The current pontiff is widely regarded as a progressive, for example, approving blessings for same-sex couples. Paus yang sekarang ini inginnya inklusif, menerima apa saja. Tetapi mestinya menerima apa saja, siapa saja itu sesuai dengan ajaran-ajaran agamanya, bukan kemudian keinginan beliau sendiri, keinginan Paus sendiri. Kita tidak ingin bahwa kedatangan Paus di Indonesia ini merupakan sebuah kampanye terselubung terhadap LGBT yang memang beliau dukung. But in neighboring Timor Leste, the third stop on the Pope's itinerary, the picture is different. Just two months before the Pope's visit, the nation held its annual Pride Day. The church opened for everybody. We did not discriminate either you this or that, but the church opened, welcome everybody. Even those having this uh, inclination to LGBT, they also are involved. Sometimes some even, uh, some even uh, readings or uh, in the choir. After independence, we can see that uh, people who become part of the LGBT community, they emerge. For me, it is a positive thing. I think for, for me, the most important thing is how we open our heart. The acceptance is more important um, uh, for, for this community. But the church is not without criticism in Timor-Leste. The island nation is still heavily patriarchal, where, according to the International Women's Development Agency, only 20% of women are paid for their labor. There are concerns whether the Catholic Church, a highly patriarchal institution itself, reinforces this in Timor-Leste. Although we still have very strong patriarchal society here, but we can see more and more women play active role in public sphere. There are certain things that uh, the church, but not imposed publicly, but people who go to church, they still have some prohibitions here and there, although most of our societies still very much have a strong faith in Catholicism. 
somehow they managed to separate being a faithful Catholic people and society in general. Then there are also the scandals the church is embroiled in. Former Timorese bishop and independence hero Carlos Bello was accused of sexual misconduct in 2022 and had been censured by the Vatican. It is unclear if the Pope will address the scandal when he's here, as he had in other countries. Any abuses committed by any member of uh, the clergy in Timor-Leste, it's a kind of taboo to talk. People are aware of that, people acknowledge what happened, but it's already always considered as taboo to reveal that one. But the Bishop Bello case is something that gives some opportunity for people to talk about that. It's open up some uh, space for people to talk. We know that it is now being handled uh, in, in, in the Vatican. We know that there they have all the means and ways in order to address that properly, uh, 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 that, uh, that case. This is like an example of a photograph taken during the period of the Great Famine in Timor-Leste. This one shows the concentration camp uh, during the Indonesian occupation. So why we keep this? Because we want people to learn, particularly our young generation, to learn about our past from different perspectives, from victims, but also from some policy regarding the conflict in Timor-Leste. And in a similar way, when the Pope comes, he will need to speak to a new generation of young Timorese. After all, it is a generation that may not be as connected to their faith as their parents were. The young generation, they are very, they exposed to a new culture, new modernity, um, values and so on. Even they are practicing or registered as a baptized, as a Christian Catholics, but uh, they're not very religious in the sense of the elders' generation who are practicing the religions, rituals, and so on. We take all the powers, we take all the change, we take all the economy from the youths. We're not giving them, them a change, opportunity. How can you expect the youth to behave in what you're expected as a re in, a, in a religious sense? The development or survival of the church in Timor-Leste, it's essential to draw engagement and dialogue with different generations and different socio-economic realities. Uh, if the church wants to remain relevant, it has to engage with uh, all kinds of realities and social groups. When Pope John Paul II visited Timor in 1989, he found an island under harsh Indonesian rule. Now, when Pope Francis comes, he will visit a country that has moved beyond its troubled past. We have to recognize that from the political perspective, Timor-Leste Indonesia is fully reconciled. Uh, particularly when both nations agreed to establish this, uh, the Commission of Truth and Friendship where officially Indonesia admitted that yes, they committed crimes against humanity and war crime in Timor-Leste, and also they regret for that. So from political uh, perspective, narrative, that was the uh, end line of when we talk about political reconciliation with Indonesia. Now, Timor-Leste and Indonesia share close ties with Indonesia being one of Timor-Leste's largest trading partners. Indonesia also championed the Timorese bid to join ASEAN. And it is the spirit of fraternity and peace that many hope Pope Francis will bring to his Asian tour. Taking into account the world today, the world in Ukraine, the world in Gaza, we in Asia, 
We don't want any war from the north to the south. And that is why we think that um, the visit of Pope, not only for Timor-Leste, but is coming to Indonesia, to Papua New Guinea, it is um, like an appeal to peace. Mari sesama bangsa Indonesia lintas agama, terutama sekali Islam dan Katolik, mari kita semakin memperkuat persaudaraan kita yang tujuannya cuma satu. Mari kita bangun bangsa Indonesia yang adil, makmur, dan sejahtera. Semua adalah satu bangsa, satu bahasa, satu negara. Saudara, saudara, semua saudara kita semuanya. Saya melihat rekaman-rekaman eh, video Pahos dimanapun juga dia berkunjung selalu memompakan spirit eh, toleransi ya, keber, kebersamaan keberadaban selalu ingin berkontribusi bagaimana menciptakan suasana yang kondusif untuk melahirkan sebuah sebuah masyarakat yang damai, tenang nah itu yang kita harapkan It's what we need in Timor right now, not uh, a church as an institution or a church as a building or as a money, but church as a people. And we can really do what the Bible asks us to do. That is to, against the tyranny, against the oppression, against the exploitation, against injustice. That's what the religion asks us to do. And, and we need to do this. And I hope, I, I believe the Pope, my set is this.